Okay, it's working. Hello everyone, good afternoon. So I'm here on Tucker, I work at Cobra, and this talk I want to talk about uh, test-driven kernel releases. That might sound like an abstract concept, but it's not from the beginning. So there's two things this talk is really about, this kernel development and testing. So of course development is manual process, we don't have robots writing kernel code yet, but there's uh, robots running tests. In the middle you have tests that can be run by hand as well. So this talk is about these two things and how they interact with each other. Um, so just to, like, to make sure we're all on the same page, this is what automated testing normally looks like. Um, so we have contributors who write code for the kernel and also for tests. And of course these then get built and tested in some automated infrastructure. And then you have some feedback that's sent back to the, back to the contributors. There's maybe one thing you can already um, see that's kind of implied from there is this thing happens almost in parallel uh, compared to development. So development can go on and some tests can be done somewhere else like if you make some changes someone else will test it in their own time um, and if they don't test it you can still carry on doing your, de your development. So these two things are not really in sync, they're a bit in it's asynchronous if you want. So that's something that will come back later. Yes? Okay, can you hear me better now? Okay, a little bit better, I'll try to speak louder. Okay, right. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll speak for you, not for myself. So this is going to be about asynchronous testing and why it's, uh, it's like that. So this is something everybody is really familiar about. Actually, I used it in an Open Source 101 talk a few months ago. But I brought it here as, um, as a um, stepping stone for what I want to talk about next. So of course, everybody knows that the power of open source is you have one code base for, for all the users. And that's how you avoid duplication of efforts. Now, if you follow the same philosophy and apply to testing, you have what we might call open testing philosophy. Uh, which is something some people have used uh, as, a, as a name, a term people have used a bit before. Um, so we still have a single mainline code base, including some tests. We already have that in a, in a Linux kernel. We have KUnit and itself test. We have some of those open source tests like LTP and IGT. And then you have many contributors who run tests, like all the, all the developers, maintainers, and contributors in general users run tests. Um, however, there's two more things here, like uh, test results, sent upstream. So that's something we, I mean, it doesn't really seem like it means anything in the context of the Linux kernel. But if you look at other systems that use, for example, GitLab CI, I don't think GitLab CI is a good fit for the Linux kernel. If you look at how it works, um, for every Git release, every Git revision, or every release of the project, you have the results with it. So with an upstream source code, you also have some uh, test results associated with it. Um, so that comes in with having results, uh, a summary of results in each release. And like I was saying before, in, in the kernel, the testing happens kind of asynchronously. If you have um, a real CI system, or what, what I mean by real, if, if you look at uh, GitLab CI examples, um, typically you can't have a change merged unless it passes some tests. Whereas for the kernel, it's more like if nobody shouts, there's, there's a regression, development carries on. Um, and so if you follow the same philosophy as uh, with open source, with open testing philosophy, then uh, you reduce the um, efforts of uh, you know, running the same test, running the same tests all over again. Because if the results are already upstream, you already know what the new version, if your results are provided with the upstream, uh, then you already know um, that the results, so you don't have to repeat, repeat them yourself. Now this is kind of the, the flip side of my previous slide. Uh, the, the flip side of my previous slide, uh, what I like to call the hidden mass of testing, is because of course the Linux kernel is tested to death everywhere. People test it, developers test it all the time, uh, OEMs test it over time, all the time, distros, but you don't really see the results. Or well, maybe you see the results, but if you do a, a check out of a Linux Linux kernel, you have the source code, you have documentation, you have tests being defined, but you don't know whether they work or not. You don't really know if it builds or not unless you build it or you look if someone else has built it. So um, in a way, it's a bit like um, as if it was downstream. Like, you know, if you take a kernel and make some changes to the code, we all understand that's downstream changes until you've sent it upstream. If you take a kernel and run some tests with it, like try to build it and realize that maybe some tests are passing, some are failing, start investigating, even if you don't touch the code, that's already some extra work you've done. You've added some value, you found something, 
if you keep it for yourself, then that's kind of downstream. So that that's where the open testing philosophy comes in. Maybe you can have, maybe we can have a way of having this extra value uh, built upstream so other people know about it. Um, yes, yeah, so right now we don't really have a canonical solution for doing this with a kernel. So before we go into how we might solve this, there's, uh, there's already a lot of uh, automated testing available in the open uh, for, for mainline. So I've just picked four uh, kind of typical ones. So the first one is Sysbot, you know, it's a um, uh, syscall fuzzing tool that does a lot of uh, testing all the time. Uh, and it has some really good features like an automated bisection and it can uh, create some reproducer programs. So if it finds a problem, it can create a, a small program that you can run just to reproduce the issue. Um, so that finds a lot of problems. And uh, however, there's one maybe one thing about this is, again, it's another example of testing happening at a different pace compared to development because it takes such a long time to run fuzzing. It, you know, you can't have for every release candidate or for every patch on the, on the mailing list, you can't wait for, for fuzzing to complete. So that's very good, but it's, uh, it's not the same as, as having uh, um, releases gate, gated on test results, if you want. Uh, then there's kernel CI, which is the, um, actually the project I've been working on for a while. Um, so it has a tailored CI system. The idea is it's distributed to so have test farms in many, like 10 different test farms in different, uh, you know, individuals and organi organizations have their own test farm for hardware. Uh, but we're also running um, tests in Kubernetes, like we're starting to run KUnit in Kubernetes. So it's trying to be generic and everybody, like we've had maintainers many times come to us and say, can we build this and run this? And normally we find a way to do it. Uh, sometimes they would, their own test uh, farm uh, online with their own hardware if they wanted to do that. There's also a KCIDB database, uh, which is um, a way to uh, aggregate all the test results from other CI systems, well, from kernel CI, but also others. Um, we have some results from Rexbot, Rexbot already, actually, uh, sorry, from Sysbot in KCIDB. So that's one step towards trying to have uh, a central canonical place for having all the results for the kernel, for upstream kernel. And it's a Linux Foundation project and it's kind of the, the, the mission that it was set for. Uh, there's Red Hat CKI, uh, which focuses on, well, it does Fedora kernels and mainline and stable, um, and runs some of the tests. Um, I'm mentioning it here because they also contribute to KCIDB, so if you go on the uh, the KCIDB dashboard, which is a work in progress. You can see results from uh, Sysbot, from Red Hat CKI, from Kernel CI, and maybe others as well. Um, so here you can see, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bit difficult to, on this slide to find the results, but you can see some results for each each kernel uh, revision. And then uh, Rexbot, which is what Dorsten talked about uh, this morning. Um, which is a tool to gather all known regressions. So that's another way also of having a central place for regressions. So you don't really know what has been tested, but at least you know where some problems were found. So that's, of course, part of the equation. And what's really good about Rexbot is that it, it has a seamless integration with the email workflow. So people are, you know, um, that's how maintainers work. So you have to, um, you don't have to change your tooling, you just use your normal email email based system uh, to be able to report regressions and and, and um, update the system. Okay, so that was like a, a quick overview of some automated test systems. Now I wonder, I'll do a, qu a quick question. Can you raise your hand if you already knew about these four test systems, like if you've been familiar with the four of them? Okay, so about half of the people, okay, that's good. <laughs> Sorry, I'm making noise. Right, so now this, this is the, the main point of this talk, I think. It's how to actually include the results when you have an upstream kernel release. Uh, and I think what's really important is, is focusing on the results, not really how they got run. So you have test, and then that test can be run by hand. Or it could be a maintainer script or local workflow that the maintainer has. Or it could be an automated system. Um, at the end of the day, it's going to be some results, like the least common denom denominator. And we can make a summary of these results and have it included in, in a release. So when you check out um, a version of the Linux kernel, you can tell 
directly which tests have been run. That's the idea. Um, of course, it, it's not that <laughs> as trivial as it sounds, but let's get into this gradually. Uh, what are the benefits of doing that? So it's really useful for users in general. So if you run, so if you, know, if you start making a product, uh, or even without making changes to the kernel, you set you set up a system, and you want to run some tests on it to see whether it's working or not. If you run some tests and they fail, if you have the results, like a reference set of results provided with the version, say if it's a LTS kernel, you can see all the tests that have been run for it, and you can see that your test is failing, maybe it's because there's, um, the, at least you know you might have an issue with your system. If you don't have the results there, the test is failing, you have to test, try to test the, the version in a, you know, you have to wonder whether the, uh, the release was made knowing that it was a failure, a test failure, or basically you don't really know if it's an issue that you need to report. Um, so that saves you some, some uh, investigation, basically. Let's try to put it simply. Um, but basically it's about trying to avoid the works for me syndrome. So if we just assume that uh, a release is made because uh, the maintainer or the people who worked on the code saw no problem with it, then uh, it doesn't mean it's going to work for other people. And also to be precise about why um, why it works, or maybe it's something if some things don't work, at least be precise about the things that don't work. So this added information maybe is not um, typically valuable directly for new maintainers. Maybe maybe it is, uh, but I think it's really really useful for people who are not too familiar with all the all the code and how it's been deployed and how sorry how it's been developed. Uh, so they don't already know about the known issues and limitations and what changes are coming next. <coughs> um, of course it comes with some challenges. So it's a slight shift in workflow because typically um, that's going back to what I said about asynchronous testing. So you have development going on at a certain pace and testing going on at another pace. So um, having the tests done after a release um, that's the typical way of things, uh, how things uh, happen now. Of course, the release candidates normally is the idea is you make a release candidate, people test it. If there's a problem, it gets fixed until the next release candidate. So there's already this, this idea of testing things before a release, but there's no formal process to say, okay, all the tests have to pass, or at least we, knew, we need to know exactly what is passing um, before declaring a release. So that's a slightly uh, slight change in, 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 my, in mindset. It could be an additional step for maintainers if they have to include some test results before before sending a pull request or before uh, declaring a, um, making a new uh, release. So how to, how to make it easy to adopt? Basically, I think it would need to be optional to at least to start with, um, and then up to each maintainer to decide how much of it they want to do and how you know how they want actually to do this within their workflow. Um, so in practice, so I've, I've thrown a few ideas on some slides to see how that could actually work in, in practice, so you have a clear idea of maybe uh, whether this is something you would want to uh, to adopt or not, or if you have maybe more suggestions. Uh, but first, we need to find like where to start. So if you start with something that's really reproducible in any hardware, that that's the way to um, to ensure that. Uh, if you provide some results and anybody can reproduce them without uh, having access to particular hardware or anything that's not available, basically, then that's already a good starting point. And that means uh, even just doing plain builds. Uh, I think there was some discussion recently about some some architectures that are not very um, not often built. Uh, so there may be some main mainline releases where actually some 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 architectures don't don't, don't build as you would expect. Or maybe they build with a very specific tool chain and you don't know about that. So uh, having a, a way to describe exactly how all the kernels or well, you know, all the architectures could be built for a, for a release and having a list of uh, officially supported binaries, well not really officially supported, but a reference set of tool chains, maybe with Docker images, so people can reproduce that and compare with their own system as a reference point. Of course, you could do builds with sparse enable um, and coxit check and KUnit and device tree validation. There's a lot of things you can do that are really hardware agnostic. And I want to add one more thing here is the documentation, which is already uh, built, of course. There's uh, docs.kernel.org. 
So that's already something that's created on top of the source code. So when you get a kernel release, you have the documentation already kind of generated into HTML for you. So if we can do that, we can also, you know, following the same concept, we could produce um, the results for QUnit, we could produce the results of proxy check and all that. We could have these files as well available. So here's a like RFC one. I put like three. So the first idea is maybe having some result files in tree, a bit like in Linux. Next, you have the merge logs. You know, you have the next directory with some files, list of all the things that were done to create the the branch. Um, so that could I don't know how big that could be, um, but the idea would be to update it in each release. So um, every time there's a new stable point release, the files get replaced with a new set. So if you have more tests or the test results change, you can see the diff just to see what happens in this release compared to the previous one. So you can release or you can rely on the git history to go back in time and see how previous releases did. So that's like a first idea. Uh, second idea is to have um, a link in a commit like a new trailet called test link for example. So in this case instead of having the files in the tree, because maybe that's a lot of data we don't want to have in the tree, it depends, but maybe it feels like extra metadata. In the same way that you know we don't keep the HTML documentation in the tree, we just keep the source. So maybe, maybe the um, generated test results should be stored somewhere else. So here I've just made up um, uh, artificial URL where things could be stored and then we just add a, a, li a link like this so people can go there and find out um, what was run the test results for, for this release. Yeah? Yeah, sure. So th this might be a silly question, but um, wouldn't you just only want to do a release if the tests are passing? Yes. So what would be the use case of having a results file if the only way that you would release it is if it passed in the first place? Yes, I think that's at the maintainer's discretion. So maybe some tests will be considered as um, as okay to be failing. Uh, but yeah, in principle, that's really how the CI system should work. So at least there shouldn't be new failures. There shouldn't be regressions. So if you know something is known to fail because there's a problem with the test, or we know we understand why, maybe we stop running the test. But yeah, absolutely. Normally, there shouldn't be a release. Based, you know, but that means. Um, that means that the maintainers really have to stick to the rule then, because you know, unless we have a CI system that enforces it, it's still going to be up to each maintainer to decide whether they like let that co like let their code uh, be part of the release or not, having seen the results. Yeah. That, that's fair. I, I guess I wonder if if the maintainer says that a test is flaky and they don't care about it, I wonder what the value would be in including it in the first place in a results file. Yeah. Is, it, is it just so that we get we document that they basically made that decision and we're releasing it anyways? Yeah, if the test is flaky, it's, it's basically like not running it if it's not adding any information. So um, yeah, maybe it should be fixed or, or removed if it's not relevant. Yeah. Um, okay, so there's three ideas. So first idea is they're having files in the tree. Second idea is they're having files somewhere else with a link. And third idea is to have it in Git metadata. I know some people have uh, talked about that before, I think. Um, uh, I couldn't find a reference to it, but I've, I think I've seen it in discussions before. Like we could have something a bit like Git notes, but call it Git results, for example. And then you have some metadata, so it's really happening separately from 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 the code. So that way, it's not intrusive in any of the workflow, which is add some data to it. And that could be links again, or it could be it depends how much data metadata data met, depends how much metadata we want to include it in in Git, but it could be a, a summary, uh, maybe a link for, for each test suite, or it depends, or a, list, or a link for each subsystem. I mean, there's many many things we could do about that. Um, so because there's many things to could do, uh, we could do have added a few thoughts. So maybe we could have um, things provided on a per subsystem basis. So uh, the idea was, would be like if you do a git, uh, you know, if you do a send a pull request with code from a maintainer, you could also add some results with it that would go in a in a subdirectory, either in the files or a link to a, a set of results that then get all um, pulled together. Of course, that these won't be integrated tests; it would be just for the changes of one subsystem. So, some more tests would need to be run to verify that changes from one subsystem don't break another one. Um, but still, you know, it's one possibility of scaling up, uh, scaling up between the the different maintainers, different subsystems. 
Um, and like for a Rex bot, I think it's very important to have something that works with a, with a current regular email development workflow so people can just use their tools. So if there's some crazy CI going on somewhere, it doesn't really matter where it's coming from as long as it, in the end we can have some, some plain text results, maybe with some links, more, more details and logs somewhere else, but at least in terms of the workflow it should be like plain text manageable. And yeah, this is where <laughs> one of the reasons I'm doing a talk here is I'm, I'm interested to hear, maybe not today or maybe not right now, but if you have some ideas, you can bring them up now. Um, but I wonder whether this sounds like uh, an interesting concept. Maybe it's too early for that, for the kernel. Is it worth, is it a goal that's worth pursuing? Um, and does it seem worth the effort? I'm wondering, maybe um, maybe it would be good to start like um, an RFC thread or a KML to discuss that a bit further, but because it's Still a bit vague right now. Like in my mind, there's many ways to do to do this. I thought it would like either not go anywhere or explode into a complicated tree of threads, <laughs> depending on how strong um, how strong people's opinions are. So, does anybody have any any thought now? Who thinks it's in, it's an interesting idea? Maybe raise your hand if you think it's it's worth it. Okay, I think it's about half. <laughs> it's, it doesn't seem to be the same people who knew about the four testing systems. So that's good. <laughs> So there is like a testing catch on and over. The, the mic for there's someone here. Um, yeah, so I like the idea, and I mostly liked I think your RFC one because of uh, having history. Uh, I like it a lot because that would if I. Just for the history, I, I, I think that's obvious. I just wonder if you, mind for I'm a maintainer for for the IceCrazy subsystem for lots lot of drivers for Arcid. Uh, so and I, I used to build, did some build testing myself. Now I only do live build testing because I pretty much rely on on the Intel build bot to do that. And I wonder if. Um, you couldn't maybe like it was mentioned before, the you uh, expect maintain to do that if they have tests it should be accurate and but the actual testing if it couldn't be automated by some bot uh, and would go shortly before the, before a release candidate is released do the whole testing for you and uh, include the results automatically uh, because that would that would be okay for me. I just take out the tests, but the actual testing is done by, by some powerful entity. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That, <coughs> that makes a lot of <coughs> a lot of sense, which is why <coughs> sorry, I had this talk about uh, this slide about focusing on the results. So the results could be coming from a, from a full CI system or just something you run by hand. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh. That happens every time there's a flying mic. One person has to get it on the head. So I, I, I like the idea of keeping test results anywhere, um, especially since release to release, hopefully you would be adding new tests, right? So your reports would be different per release. Um, my question, though, is uh, has there been any thought on using any, like, the fault injection framework that's in the kernel where, you know, often it's the failure paths and drivers that are, like, never touched until something horribly goes wrong, and then it really, really goes wrong after that. Has that been explored to loop that into, like, KUnit or any other things like that where you can, like, fault a K malloc after three allocations or something like that? Uh, yeah, I believe uh, some KCL tests, I believe, do that. And uh, because they enable some special kernel configs to have like a back a backdoor, if you want, to, uh, to to compromise some state internally to simulate the problem. Yeah, but that falls kind of within the test that could be run. Um, so the question I'm asking here is whether we should include the results or not, but it's very important also. I think if, if the results are included and people see them, they think, oh, that's meeting. Like, you know, if we see some results, okay, the, the free text tests are being run, that's great. We're all about injecting faults, you know, then that kind of prompts uh, people to add more tests because they want to see their results uh, as well. Yeah, because you're really going 
one way or the other, it's either test-driven development or you're doing, I'm writing the test after I did the development and then iterating on the test until it passes. And I don't think that that's terribly useful. It's usually the first one is, what are the things that I really wanna make sure don't fail? And then build the tests and then that kind of thing helps build more tests. Yeah, I think it's a good idea as well. Um, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit on Friday, but the one thing I would I would ask is, do you think that the tests that should be included in the results.json are exclusively in tree tests? Because a lot of the CI systems, there's like kernel test, robot tests, Pharonix, there's like a million systems that have out of tree tests, XFS tests. And it seems like if we're going to have a results file that publishes like the stability of a release, <clears throat> it should probably include tests that are in tree and also themselves include metadata and configuration where the, the maintainers have signed off on the stability of the test cases and, and stuff like that. Yeah, so it was your question about out of tree tests? Y yeah, like yeah. Sh like would the results file that we included include out of tree tests or would it just be in tree tests? Yeah, okay. Well, the issue with the out of tree tests is uh, of course they're not tied to the version of the kernel. So it's only when you run them, you run a p particular version of the kernel. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I guess that could be done. Uh, I, I didn't mention it here in terms of where to start because it seems easier to start with the tests that are in the tree. I, I, agree. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, I think uh, yeah. it's good to encourage tests be, to be added to the tree. And I think yeah. uh, if we're right. going to do that, it, it would make sense to keep them as only entry tests. Yeah, but if we can have a way, like if there's a link to say here's some LTP test results and that's explicit enough about how to reproduce them, like the version of LTP, how LTP was built, then that could be done as as an extension, I suppose. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's I guess what we would have to figure out is if we would want to include like LTP tests because mm -hmm. they're they're just separate from the tree. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, I. Send, uh, send the, the test perf, perf tools, I maintain perf tools, and I uh, do tests for like a view test and uh, perf test that, that is an uh, entry in, in test. And I was sent to Linus as part of the sign tag, and he asked me to just send it on the cover letter for patch series. So uh, it's being uh, stored like in the mailing list. So w w one of the options that there are. The only problem I have is I now need to link. The, the test results to the, the, the pull request to the merge that, where it was introduced. That is in that not just the version for the kernel, but the version at least for the compiler. Let's say yeah. or compiler or for yeah. some of the components I to build the kernel. Yeah. After it doesn't work, but I using updated components, so it's something else to, to consider. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's great to see that at least it's sent on a mailing list. Then, when you get out, when you get the source code, when you check out the source code, you don't see the results. But if you look on the LK now, you can find yes, the yes, that, that, that's how a, it works. There's a trace of before it was applied. Linus maybe saw that it was passing. Yes. Okay. So maybe that's an intermediate step. Like if, even before we can add it, uh, yeah. some places maybe it's a good trend that other people could be doing. Like if. If you get a pull request on a maintainer, having results from KUnit, KSELF tests, and stuff like that, uh, maybe for device tree, there's already device tree validation. Every time there's a device tree pull request, I haven't checked myself, to be honest. But that would seem like a good trend to start, I think. Okay. Did anybody find the, the side completely horrible, like having having a link here that, that seems like there's something you don't want to see? Uh, okay. A big part of the discussion will be what happens at the end, or the shortly before the final release of, of the kernel, what happens if not all are passing. So when it's a, a, uh, okay to have Release a kernel with the failed tests, or what? And what are the criteria for that? Or I so, uh, I think that is going to be an interesting discussion. Yeah. So I, I don't think we can't enforce having all tests zero because if you, it might you, you might do a generic update and you break some ancient hardware nobody has access to. So. But where where where's the limit to s uh, where, where where's the line to say okay accept the failing test or we don't so that uh, that's uh, that's tricky. 
I guess it will depend on the nature of the test and the nature of the failure. But I think the main takeaway from this is at least you know there's something that's failing. At least you have more clarity over what's going on. Because maybe sometimes there's a failure and people don't really know how to report it. Like if it's intermittent or they don't really understand why it's failing. Like this should be working. Maybe it's a problem with my test. You know, at least if it's like a systematic thing, you have the results and then you can discuss it and decide to ignore it as a positive decision instead of just having it in the in the hidden mass. I'll say I like number two, because that's easy <laughs> for me. Um, but I don't want to see, I mean, I think Lisa will complain about this too. If we check this into the tree all the time, it's going to be a lot of churn, and nobody really cares over time. It's like, it's nice to prefer a link to those people that do care. We get lots of companies ask me saying, how did you test this? How, why did you do this release? Why is this in there? Can you prove it? I can point there, remove guy to be testing.kernel.org. It's an agglomeration of them all. I, that, that's easy, simple. Meta is somewhere else. So I vote for that because that's easy for me. <laughs> right. OK, that's good, good feedback. The only thing is this, is this needs to be persistent over time, like archived the same way as. Well, yeah, so we can, we can do that. Yeah. Uh, we can do it easily. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, most CI systems discard their old data, so it can't just be like a random CI system. It has to be a specific thing. Yeah. But, yeah. That's cool. <laughs> ah, did you want to ask? No, no. I, I agree with the Chen thing. I was just going to ask, maybe it's a stupid question, but if the tests should be uh, easily readable, if they are based on the existing tool chain, and if they are also deterministic, then what is the value of putting the results in tree? Could you not just check out that particular commit and run the tests yourself? Yeah, but having them completely reproducible and easy and trivial to run means um, that means you provide the environment in which they will run. Because then if you say, okay, KUnit should work, okay, well, then if you use a different old GCC compiler, maybe it will actually fail. If, you know, there's, there's plenty of things, maybe that in principle it should always work, but maybe some different things, subtle differences in your environment means it won't work. Um, or maybe some tests will work and not others. So um, if you put the effort uh, if you put all you know put things in place, spend the effort to put something in place in place to have an environment where the results are kind of guaranteed in principle, then you might as well also run the test to prove that it's actually guaranteed. Um, so I think it's a bit like um, um, it, it feels. Uh, I see exactly where you're coming from because it seems like a zero sum thing. It's you know. It just seems that the two things are a yeah. bit incongruent with one another, but. Uh, yeah. I see your point, because the tests themselves are not always simple. I like the example of documentation, like why generate documentation on docs.kernel.org when everybody can run the documentation themselves and build the HTML themselves. Yeah. 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 And strangely enough, companies want to see the paperwork. <laughs> they, they don't, they, they'll trust us. So they want to say, if I just say, oh, you have to trust us, now I'm pointing them at those tested buys, and that points to a mailing list. Because I can point that, I do that link oh. that points to the email. That upper link was my RC release. They can see the releases. So like Huawei, I don't know what they tested internally. I don't care. But they said, hey, it passed me. So now they have a paper trail. They just want a paper trail. Let's give them an easy paper trail. It's, it's worth as much as paper, but some companies care. I see uh, <coughs> at least two different questions here. One is the test strategy and how we tie that with the release cycle and what tests we need to run and all that. So uh, that's, I think, interesting one. But the second one is what do we do with the test results? And I really like the idea of centralizing them, making sure they're easily accessible, ideally with a way to uh, also possibly subscribe uh, to, uh, to part of the results. If I maintain a driver or a subsystem, I may be interested to, to receive notifications for failures that I wouldn't know about uh, otherwise. But bundling that with the kernel itself, uh, I, I understand that it gives you persistence if we start on the entry. But I fear there's going to be a fairly large quantity of data in a kernel that's already fairly big. And I'm entirely sure it's, it's worth it. So I, li I like uh, option number two better. 
And I would like to ask also, you mentioned that we need that to be persistent, uh, which I think is doable. But is there value in really long-term persistence? Do we need to start test results that we will look at 15 years from now for kernel that we'd be 15 years old at that point? I think the same applies with uh, the first link here. If you want to look at the uh, email threads, you know, I think it, I think it matters. Uh, because we don't know what, what the future holds, really. <laughs> so, may, but maybe some links, like if you follow that test summary, link, maybe some links will be to some CI systems and the data will be gone. But at least you have like some summary as a trace of what was done at the time. So I think that's useful from a history point of view. I think there would be technical solutions to do that. Maybe a separate Git tree with the, all the results that would automatically generate things that are on the website. And if you want to go uh, to the Git history, that, uh, that would be feasible as well. I think the main reason the main reason why some more data is discarded is just because of the huge amount of space it takes. I mean, if we have infinite storage, we wouldn't bother re removing all data because that that can still be useful if you want to run some stats about the whole history of the kernel, how many tests were run, or whatever. I mean, there's always you know geological <laughs> data that could be dug out. Of it. So um, I was just trying to think through how the link would work. So um, some of these test results take a while to run, right? So it's sort of an asynchronous thing. So Greg tags 5.10.1.1.18 and pushes it somewhere, and at that point, that link is empty, and then they populate? Or is it something he does before? So I think actually, uh, well, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think a real stable release coincides with the last RC uh, release on the RC branch. So maybe then, there's, hopefully, there's a bit of time, like a day, or in between. So when when a new release is pushed on the stable RC tree, some tests can take. Maybe we can have like an envelope uh, of 24 hours for running tests, and then you know if nobody reports any other issues or if the if the tests okay, work, so then, then the next day you make the, the real release, which is exactly the same code. So you kick it off as like testing of an RC release and then rename the URL, something like this. I'm also, th I'm also uh, thinking, like, what well, is the paper 12? But we also want tests to be actionable, right? And actually, first, set a broke. But then if you're, they're immutable, we found some, like. Does it, does it matter? We can have things show up two years later based on 118. If it still fails, it fails. And they wanted the record of that. I mean, there is, people have noticed that an RC doesn't always match what I release based on the testing. So I rip things out and I just assume that I remove the offending commit, it worked. And that's not necessarily true. I mean, that'll just show all the accumulated test results of this tag. Over time, I mean, data is free storage for us. This isn't that a lot of data, so I don't care if people keep submitting stuff over time. If we give them access to submit stuff over time, maybe we cut them off after uh, six months. Let's see what happens. These are easy procedural problems, right? I think we argue about this type of stuff. So my, yeah, my, my concern was more that it sort of becomes more of a scoreboard than something that actually helps fix things. But if, if the paper trail is important, then maybe that's all right. I think, I think it, we could like start, start with something simple, like just doing a few kernel builds, for example, and see whether how much overhead it is, see whether it worked in practi practice or not, and then it, maybe it will create some incent incentive for other people to add tests. And I, that's a kind of culture shift that I think could happen. But yeah, it has to be something that people want to do and is easy to do. And I'm not sure we'll find solutions. If we really want this thing to happen, I'm sure there's ways to do it. Yeah. I think, generally speaking, it's, about, it's a bit like thinking, you know, initially kernel development, you had just tables and patches, and then there was source control that was added to it because other people did source control, and then a custom tool was made for kernel. Now, all the new projects, if you start a new project now, you might want to just set it set it up on GitLab with GitLab CI or GitHub Actions or whatever, because you know it's easy to set up and that already gives you some control quality, you know, code control quality, um, and so 
how to do this with a kernel, I guess it's because it's a big project and it's, you know, there's already an established way of doing it, um, is, a, is a challenge and maybe that's one step in that direction, but it's not because it's a challenge and because of all the history that we shouldn't be doing it because all the other projects are benefiting from having a, a real um, synchronous, as I to call it, synchronous CI system where you don't release something unless the tests have run. Okay. Can we try this? Because if you notice, there's no kernel CI results there. Because I don't have a way to reference kernel CI commits to these. Yeah, we can, that's an easy one to start. However, it's not um, persistent. But we could, what we could do is for each uh, stable release, we could, you know, kernel CI could generate a static page. Yeah. And then that's Let's start with that. Yeah. And see, people can argue and we can go from there. <laughs> okay. The, for the, on the paper trail comment, it's not just a paper trail for bean counters either. If For those of us who are trying to get our employers or our customers to upgrade kernels and to migrate kernels, this is something we can point them to and say, look, now in the 510 LTS we have this number of tests, in the 515 LTS we have a bunch more tests and all the old ones still pass and there's a bunch of new ones. We start to have better arguments for also helping migrate kernels, so let's not forget the, that part either. And just to add on to that, um, I mean, people accidentally break things. And like for BPF, we have self-tests that are deterministic and they pass 100% of the time. But there was a test recently that broke because we merged some patches and there was a K probe that was out of date. So like this is just a way to sanity check. You know, I feel, feel like it's a basic, basic thing to do. And uh, just one more thing, there were some questions about testing, and so uh, David is doing a talk on Friday at 2 p.m. Uh, about testing, so that's why also I didn't go too much into uh, what is the unit, was it, what is the self test and all these things, and just did like a quick overview of automated CI systems, because David is going to do a much deeper, d a deep, a deeper dive into this. So. Okay, how much time have we got? Oh, we're 10 minutes past now already, so. I'll be quick. Okay, all good. Thank you very much. <laughs>